I must say it's a pleasure to be able to talk about Embatavi now that we've transitioned from a project to an operation. Uh, I spoke previously when we were in the construction phase and yes, we are, we are now up and operating. Now, Embatavi, and I'm sure many of you are aware, uh, is an operation in Madagascar that is at nameplate design going to produce 60,000 tons of nickel and 5,600 ton of cobalt along with 210,000 tons of ammonium sulfate. And actually with the ammonium sulfate, as Paul just mentioned, Bill Gates is doing some uh, very good work in, in Africa and we're actually uh, working with him to move some of that ammonium sulfate and make it available to some of the African countries that could well, very well benefit from the application of nutrients. The project lifespan is now up to 30 years. I think when we started the project it was about 27 years. But as we've worked through our drilling plan, uh, we've been able to add 30 years to, uh, to the project. Uh, the major partners are Shared International, who is the, also the operator. We have Sumitomo Corporation from Japan, who is not to be confused with uh, Sumitomo Metals Mining. They're two separate entities, and uh, Sumitomo Metals Mining is not involved in the, in the project. It's Sumitomo Corporation. And then we have Corez, which is a Korean consortium, government consortium, and SNC-Lavalin, who is the EPCM on the project. The project is divided up into three major areas. First of all is the mine, which is up at Muramanga, uh, and we bring down slurried ore from the mine site to the plant site down at, at Tomasina. That comes through a 220 kilometer pipeline from the mine down to the plant site. Uh, there's been a lot of questions around the pipeline, and yes, it works very, very well. The company that built it, PSI, out of the United States has built pipelines of 800 kilometers in distance and over 1,100 kilometers in distance. So this was a rather small project for them. Uh, it's, it's a buried line, uh, cathodic protection. It runs from an 1,100 meter elevation almost down to sea level. There's only one pump at the mine site to move slurry over a vertical section. It relies on gravity for the rest of its route. Uh, we actually have to put two restrictors in the line to slow down the momentum of the slurry to control erosion on the line. So it, it works very, very well. And then that slurry comes all the way to the plant site at Tomasina, which is divided into three areas. We have our refinery, we have our HPAL uh, operation, and one of the things people don't realize in terms of operating in Madagascar, there is no infrastructure. All the infrastructure has to be built and supplied. So there's a number of utility and ancillary plants that go along with this, and that includes sulfuric acid plants, power plant, water treatment plant, air separation, um, hydrogen plant, sulfide precipitation plant. Uh, and all these ancillary plants have to be operating in order for HPAL and the refinery to work together. So it is a very, very large facility due to the fact, again, that you have to supply all your own utilities uh, and, and we're void of infrastructure. So the map here just shows from our mine site at Moramanga, the pipeline that comes all the way down to Tomasina. Uh, the refinery was built at the port city of Tomasina and for very strategic reasons. Uh, we bring in, one, a lot of feedstock into the uh, plant site. It's over three million tons come in annually and it's very easy to move out our product. We are, I, I believe, nine kilometers from the port, from the plant site to the port. So we don't have a lot of the challenges that a lot of other facilities have in terms of getting their product from their uh, operations to a port for uh, export. Uh, it's very, very close. I just want to point out, I'm going to talk later, you'll see the green area up at uh, Muramanga around the pur purple area. The, the purple area is actually the footprint of our mine, which is about 3,900 hectares. And then we have the, the green area around there and the orange area at uh, Ankarana which are environmental offset areas. And I'm going to talk about them a little later on, uh, during the presentation, but just want to point them out now. Uh, 2012 production, we made just about 5,700 tons of cobalt and almost 500 tons of nickel. And in 2013, as we ramp up, we expect uh, about 35,000 tons of nickel production and 3,000 tons of cobalt production. Uh, nickel, we produce in the form of briquettes. Uh, later on, 
Uh, once we get up to 100% capacity, we will be looking at producing powder, but powder is more of an, an art uh, than a science to produce on, uh, for nickel. And we first want to get up to full capacity before we uh, start finessing the operation. So uh, we'll run, till we get to 60,000 tons, we'll continue to make solely nickel briquettes. But in cobalt, uh, it's much easier to make powder, and the powder that we actually produce is what we, uh, we put into briquettes, and it's, it's suitable for uh, sale right from the onset of powder production. So uh, for cobalt, we have both uh, nickel and, or sorry, briquette and powder production. Our vision, and I have to take you down to the third, third bullet on there because the reality of it is, first and foremost, the project has to make money. That's, that's the reason why the project was put in place. Uh, secondly, in doing so, we want to be able to contribute to the well-being of Madagascar, the people in Madagascar and the country as a whole. And it's a real challenge working in this part of the world. Uh, this is for the better part, the only, as we say, the only show in town. It's the largest single major investment that Madagascar has ever seen. It's the largest investment that the African Development Bank has ever participated in. So there's a lot of eyes on the project in terms of international participation and wanting to see how well we do. Uh, so it's important, again, that the project benefits the country and, and the people that live in it. And in doing so, Shared as the operator and all the joint venture partners have stood uh, very firm on ensuring that they have an outstanding environmental performance, positive social impacts, and, and impeccable safety records, uh, which again is a real feat or a real challenge in, in countries that haven't seen pumps. Uh, they haven't seen a process operation. They've never seen heat exchangers. Uh, it's a real transition and a very steep learning curve for these people coming into the operation. In looking at, at, in looking at the project, uh, I mean, sustainable development is one of the things that is, is the primary focus. And in developing this project, there's been over 110 kilometers of roads that have been built. Uh, there's been a whole new port, a berth, uh, sorry, at the port uh, that has been constructed to bring in all those feed sources and export all our products. As I mentioned, over three million tons of uh, feed sources coming annually at full production. Uh, they built 11, we've had to build 11 kilometers of new rail line from the plant site out to the port and back. Uh, we have six engines that pull 12 cars and they're on constant rotation from the port back to the plant. And although that was built by the plant site, <coughs> That's been handed over to Mata Rail, uh, a Madagascar operation, and they operate and maintain the rail line that provides a delivery of all the feed sources to the plant site. And you see the picture of our cobalt and nickel cans. That's how our product goes out in 250 kg cans, or in the case of nickel, we also put it in 2,000 kg bulk bags. Job creation. In Madagascar, uh, in the operation, there'll be over 2,500 jobs. Uh, over 85% of those involve Malagasy people. Uh, as the operation matures, the expat numbers will continue to decrease. Excuse me, I'm just going to grab some water here. The World Bank says that for every one job, that direct job that you create, you create another five indirect jobs. In Madagascar, we also have 3,500 contractors that are involved in the project. So you've got over 6,000 direct jobs multiplied by five indirect jobs. It creates 30,000 jobs. Uh, there's been comments that this project, as it reaches out to the community, impacts over 75,000 households. And in, we, we talk about developing countries and uh, employment rates where, you know, we talk about 8 or 9% unemployment. In Madagascar, it would be about 8 or 9% employment. It's the exact inverse. In Tomasino, when we first started the project, there was 250,000 people, residents, in the town of Tomasino, which is the major port city 
for Madagascar. There is now over a million people living in that town, all coming there looking for work. At the height of the project, there was over 18,000 people working on the project. And that was during construction. And uh, now that we've gone into operation, uh, there's a much smaller number, of course, uh, required. And so there's been a big job in terms, or a lot of work done to transition people and provide them other job, job opportunities and find them new jobs in other parts of the country. So there were a lot of efforts to provide unemployment, a form of unemployment insurance while we assisted in finding people work and to mobilize people to other parts of the country where there were jobs for them to pursue. So in terms of job creation, extensive training at, at uh, Madagascar, they actually built uh, training centers to accommodate the training of people. Uh, they, they trained tradespeople in, in, in welding, mill writing, instrument mechanics, electricians, steam fitters, uh, all of the resources and skill sets that you need at the plant site. Uh, that got extended onto people uh, for managerial, senior managerial training positions. And these weren't one or two day courses, they were 18 month courses that are then followed up by two months apprenticeships for these people to gain the necessary skill sets to be able to contribute to the operation and be able to progress in the operation and ultimately take over a lot of the expat uh, roles that are for currently being filled by expats. So uh, <clears throat> there was uh, entrepreneurship. I think there was over 700 students that participated in entrepreneurship classes in terms of companies and people uh, <clears throat> being educated on how to set up their own businesses. And a lot of these businesses uh, now provide services to the operation in Madagascar. So it's, <clears throat> it's hire local and buy local is, is the big motto there. So at the plant site, local producers supply over 900,000 kilograms of food. And agriculture is, is a big activity within the country, and a lot of people are involved in agriculture. So they, they play a critical role in providing services. There are over 2,400 Malagasy companies uh, registered with our uh, procurement people that are able to provide services. And that's in everything from catering to uh, transportation, construction services, uh, the clothing that's, that's supplied, the laundry, uh, a, a number of different areas, and uh, some of the maintenance work around the plant site, just maintaining the plant site. So different skill sets uh, at, at different levels and very involved in the operation. Uh, I talked about the training in terms of uh, building the training center and, and moving people through, and it's ongoing. Uh, they also trained a lot of other people that were never going to be part of the project, and that was to ensure that people that were working on the project were going to stay on the project and not migrate away from us quickly, because there is a steep learning curve that these people have to go through. So we provided training in uh, especially the trades uh, for people that, again, were, were never going to be at the plant site, but were able to go back out and find jobs across the country and, again, give us the ability to maintain the people that we had trained. Compliance and, and governance. And it, compliance is, is huge for the project. Uh, there's been a lot of public scrutiny. Uh, a, a big, and Battery has simply been under a magnifying glass. Uh, part of the reason for that is it's, uh, the country has a very unique biodiversity. And as a result of that, there's a lot of government or NGOs, government agencies, conservation groups that have been very, very uh, concerned about how the project has been run. And then with, um, with things like the Conflict Minerals Act, uh, there was a huge concern around how this was all structured and making sure it was, was fair in terms of labor practices, uh, not hiring children, and, and working to certain standards. So first and foremost, the Large Mining Act was developed for the project with the Malagasy government and the World Bank. And that was for the purposes of putting together an, uh, a, a, a royalty system and a infrastructure or a process to be followed that was very transparent and was very equitable. And the World Bank 
brought forward a lot of what they considered to be uh, equitable royalty payment schemes, and one and from there, uh, a royalty scheme was put together for Madagascar. But again, transparency and equity were the two main drivers in putting together the act. But the whole, uh, the whole facility is continued to or was built and continues to operate on the basis of following equator principles, extractive industry transparency initiatives, business and biodiversity offset programs, uh, and a number of programs. Uh, we feel if we had to be audited by the OECD and their guidelines that we would pass their audit requirements, uh, which has been a suggestion by some of the people from, uh, who are concerned about Conflict Minerals Act, uh, even though cobalt is not on that list. But uh, we've been very, very conscientious in terms of building to international standards, using international laws, and complying to those international laws. Transparency. Uh, we're very transparent in terms of all the activities we do, engaging the people. Uh, there's a lot of money that's handed out. Uh, there, during the last hurricane, there was, uh, uh, I think, over $100,000 that was given to people that had suffered the, well, down there they call them cyclones, but the consequences of the cyclones. There's been over a million dollars handed out uh, for some of the environmental initiatives. And we're very transparent in terms of identifying to people how much money is being uh, put forward and to who that money is, is being given to ensure that everyone's aware of where those funds are going so, and ensuring that those funds are not misdirected. Codes of conduct. Uh, this involves everything from uh, child labor, harassment in the workplace, uh, health and safety, uh, ethical behavior requirements, and this is done with all the workers and all the employees, and it's repeated on an annual basis, ensuring that they understand what the requirements are, what the expectations are, and that Embattivy is able to force compliance uh, to the standards that they've identified. Community development, there's a lot of work on agriculture in the country. As I mentioned, very uh, active agricultural community, but production is low. So they've been working with a variety of institutes, to help ensure that the uh, production is able to be increased uh, for their agricultural development, uh, working with schools, uh, helping build schools. That work is being done with UNICEF. Uh, helping to train teachers and help teachers put lesson plans together that will ultimately allow people to naturally progress from grade to grade. Stakeholder engagement at Embattivy, they have what's called a traveling road show. And they've gone out and they figure they've, they've uh, reached and spoken to over 250,000 people. And that starts right from the mine all the way down to the plant site. And one, one of the unique things about Madagascar is from region to region, there's very different laws, there's very different cultural uh, requirements slash uh, expectations. So, as you move from the mine to the plant site, you come across some very, very different uh, requirements and very unique requirements of each individual region. So uh, at, at the height of the project, I think we had, uh, with environment and corporate social responsibility, I think there was almost 1,000 people working collectively. Uh, I know environment was over 500 people involved, and CSR almost had 500 people. In each one of those groups, there's still over 300 people involved. And when you go out to the community, you, you can't go out with expatriates. You have to go out with people that are local to Madagascar and understand the people that they're talking to and the issues that they have. So it's, uh, it's a major undertaking, and the, the traveling roadshow continues to travel. Um, mitigation. Uh, there was resettlement communities that had to be developed. I showed you the pipeline earlier. Uh, as a result of that pipeline and, and some of the terrain, uh, there was a couple communities that had to be uh, moved. There was new housing built for them and uh, new settlement communities. Uh, during that pipeline construction, there was some uh, horrific storms that took place and there was some unexpected uh, erosion and, and, and sediment impacts while uh, there was excavation taking place which impacted rice fields. There was compensation put forward to farmers and, and a big effort to go and actually remove that sedimentation so that, uh, so that people's agricultural uh, means of, of, of survival were, were actually uh, rehabilitated. Uh, there's been a lot of work with, with AIDS 
uh, in terms of education. Uh, and there again, educating the young people to go out into the communities. There was over 200 people that were educated and they go out and, and transition the message. Uh, a very unique thing about Madagascar is they have a very, very low incidence of AIDS, uh, which is, of course, very, very good. They, they don't really understand why, and it's actually under study now by some international groups because they, they, they figure there's something unique about the Malagasy's that uh, uh, doesn't allow them to be as exposed or susceptible to uh, contracting AIDS. Biodiversity. Uh, going back to those... Uh, on the map, those two points that I identified to you. Again, Madagascar has a very unique biodiversity. I think you've all heard about the lemurs that, that only exist in Madagascar. And that goes on to a lot of other plants and a lot of other aquatic life. And as a result, there's been a lot of uh, concern and care that has been taken place in terms of putting together the, the, the mining plan and ultimately creating a scheme and a schedule that allows for a net gain. And you say, how can you have a net gain when you're, you're putting together a mining program? But around the mine there, that highlighted green area that I previously showed you, as the mine footprint was developed, there was a con conservation zone that, that's uh, <clears throat> gr actually greater than the footprint in the mine that allowed a lot of the species and a lot of the plants, animals, were moved out into this conservation zone and protected in that zone. The big orange area, is an actual area that has a very similar biodiversity and very similar ecosystem. And in that region, what they've done, again, it's another conservation zone, but they've gone across the country and collected any endangered species, whether it be plant, animal, or aquatic species, and moved them into that area. So they've created additional areas to actually protect the Malagasy environment. And it's been very, very successful. Uh, there's a number of groups that, that participate in managing this area. And the other thing that's a requirement by the lenders is that every quarter, the lenders hire an independent uh, third party to come in and audit the environmental stewardship uh, that has been set forward, ensuring that the environmental plan that is laid out is being complied with. And, uh, since that has been done over the last uh, two years, uh, every audit has been passed and satisfied. So at the end of the day, you're having a footprint, uh, as I mentioned, on almost 4,000 hectares of, of mining area. And uh, there's well over 9,000 uh, hectares of conservation zone that's been created to offset the impact that was made uh, in developing the mine. Again, some real unique biodiversity. Uh, that orange, the yellow frog there was a frog that was actually considered to be extinct. You see them in all kinds of pictures. Uh, and they, during, uh, during the digging of the pipeline, uh, they discovered these frogs again. So that's one of the species that, again, was uh, considered extinct, and, and they were found, and now they're being rehabilitated, and actually numbers are increasing. I think they've said they've seen an additional in the conservation zone around the, the mine, site, mine site, there's an additional 39 births of, of new lemurs, uh, which, is, which is very, very positive. And actually, uh, lemur numbers were going down, and actually they're starting to go back up again. So very, very positive. Uh, just some of the environmental groups that are involved uh, participating in the offset programs, uh, and as well as uh, the World Wildlife uh, Organization has been involved in the auditing of the Environmental Stewardship Program. So numerous, numerous partici participants at different levels in working with the project. Uh, on our website, we just have our two uh, sustainability reports. And uh, a lot of what I've uh, addressed here is within those reports. And uh, that's pretty much, pretty much an update in terms of some of the operational challenges that we, we have in Madagascar. In, in operating. And uh, again, yes, we are up and operating and uh, commissioning, and uh, it's going well. Great. Thank you, John. Um, do we have any questions? Hello. 
C-A-A-C. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, just regarding the, um, the market, I just wondered how concerned you are about um, you know, the, n the new production pushing the market into oversupply at the moment and how long you expect that to, to last. Well, we're, we're, <coughs> we're a producer, so we're always bullish on the market. Uh, but uh, we, we, we think there's room in the marketplace for, for our product and our, our metal, both uh, nickel and cobalt. And we're, we're expecting, uh, again, on the, on the nickel side, the, to, to see some growth in that market and a place, again, for, for Mbata B to be in that market. And uh, likewise, on the, on the cobalt side, we've seen with, with the low pricing, a number of transitions in the marketplace in terms of available units, cobalt units, and there's been some changes in terms of uh, concentrate flows and, and uh, now making room for potentially the metal that's coming into the market. Well, thank you, John. I think we'll move on as we're